we can probably get started now. I'm seeing the numbers start to level off, so I think we can get started. Looks like we have a pretty full house, and a Happy New Year, everyone. I would like to first uh, start by saying thank you to all of those who are attending uh, our uh, informational webinar uh, entitled How to Fuel Your Indoor Training. Uh, we have a very uh, full house today. Uh, our webinar uh, today will focus on getting the most uh, out of your indoor training sessions. Our hope is that we will be able to provide you with some insights, tools, and tactics uh, that will help you get the most out of your uh, winter sessions. Uh, we have with us uh, several members uh, from the Never Second team. Welcome, everyone. Uh, hosting today uh, will be uh, Never Second's uh, Chief Scientific Officer, uh, Dr. Oscar Yeikendrup. Uh, we are also uh, delighted and very lucky to have with us a very special guest today uh, who has been with us since the very beginning of the brand. Uh, that is Never Second athlete and, uh, 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 well, multi Olympian and uh, Ironman uh, champion Lisa Norden from the uh, great white north of Sweden. Um, <clears throat> welcome Lisa and welcome Oscar. Uh, our, our webinar today uh, will last approximately one hour and uh, 10 minutes. Uh, during the first part, uh, Lisa and Oscar will talk a bit about uh, some of Lisa's indoor training uh, insights and tactics. Uh, this will be followed by a short uh, science learning section uh, which will be led uh, through by, by Oscar rather. Uh, following Oscar's presentation, uh, we will open the discussion up to you uh, so that you can ask any questions that you may have. Uh, we'll do, of course, our best to answer uh, all of your questions. In the event that we can't, uh, aren't able to get to your question uh, for whatever reason, we'll do our best to, to follow up uh, by email uh, with you. Uh, we are also recording the session and we'll post it to our YouTube channel so that you can watch it uh, whenever it's best for you. Uh, with this said, I will turn things over uh, to the stars of our show, uh, Oscar and Lisa. Oscar? Yes, thank you very much, um, Bill. Um, and yeah, welcome everyone to another uh, Never Second uh, webinar. Um, the topic I think is very fitting for everyone who's uh, in uh, winter. Um, although personally, I always prefer training outdoor to indoor if I had a, a choice. There are also huge benefits to uh, indoor training, um, especially if you live in Stockholm or in the UK, as I do, or I'm at the moment in uh, Holland and it's incredibly wet uh, and muddy and windy. Um, so those are all reasons to uh, to go to indoor training and indoor training. Um, could of course be treadmill running or cycling or doing weights but today we'll focus or at least i will i will focus mostly on uh, cycling but if you run long enough on a treadmill then the advice would actually be uh, pretty much the same so indoor riding on rollers or a turbo um, that's not new it has been used by cyclists for many decades um, but recently, virtual riding has made it a little bit more attractive, and COVID has really made this incredibly uh, popular. I've been using uh, Zwift as a platform for a long time. I was an early adopter when Zwift was very small. Sometimes we would just ride with 10 people on the whole platform, and there was only one world, Watopia, with a limited number of roads. They had to have ghost riders so you wouldn't feel too lonely when you're out riding there. That's all very different now. Now we have many different roads, even different worlds where we can ride, many challenges. We have group rides, races, uh, workouts, uh, you name it. And sometimes there are 50,000 people riding there at the same time. There are different levels. It's almost like a game. I'm at level 54 and I've spent, I've just checked 47 days and 13 hours on Zwift since the year beginning. So almost 40,000 kilometers, 25,000 miles. And uh, Zwift translates that into 2,000 pizza slices for me. Um, the record on Zwift for a single ride is hold on to your seat it's 1828 kilometers or 1139 miles that is by Yasmine Muller in 62 hours can you imagine 
There's also a 24 hour record that is 952 kilometers. So I think my conclusion is there are some crazy people out there. Absolutely. <laughs> because these platforms are so popular and so many riders are using them and participate in all these different events, yeah, I think it's important to understand what role nutrition can play and how we can best approach nutrition for these events. Now, before we go into the recommendations and we talk a little bit about the science behind them, um, we'll have a chat with, uh, with Lisa. And uh, of course, Lisa is an absolute superstar uh, with, a lot of with a lot of experience in a number of uh, endurance uh, events, mostly triathlon. And I, Lisa, I don't know if you know this, but I saw you the very first time um, in 2012, and it was in London at the Olympics, because I had a seat that was very, very close to the finish line. And I saw you coming in together with uh, Nicola Spierich and with an impossible like final uh, sprint. And you both crossed the line and no one knew who had won. And it took a long time before they figured out who had won. And I think what they should have done is probably uh, award two gold medals at that time, as they did uh, with a track cycling event where they also they couldn't decide the difference between gold and, and silver. So at the same Olympic Games, they gave uh, gold to two athletes because they just simply couldn't distinguish gold from silver. Um, later, I saw Lisa in places like Hawaii, where I think we even rode a bike at one time. Um, she was there to train. And at the time, Lisa was focusing still on uh, Olympic distance triathlon. I was there to race Ironman age group um, and also to work with Chrissy Wellington. And we've also come across each other at altitude training camps in uh, Sierra Nevada. So Lisa, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. I'm super excited to have you in this webinar, and I'm really curious to learn about your thoughts on uh, indoor training. But let's start with how are you doing? Uh, what have you been up to since Cozumel? That was your last race, I think. So what, what's, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That was quite a presentation. Uh, I, th I believe it was nine thousandths of a second uh, that differed the gold from second in, in London. Uh, oh, wow. Unfortunately for me, triathlon do have rules that stipulates that there can only be one winner. So that's down to every individual sport to decide on how they want to play the role. If I would have been um, a swimmer over 50 meters, that would have been two golds. Or even running like the 100 meters in track and field, that would have been two golds. Triathlon, there has to be one winner and one second place. So yeah. I think actually uh, the rules changed after. So there is a Lisa Norden rule in triathlon now that I kind of <laughs> enforced. <laughs> That's great. Um, but um, yeah, Cosmel was my last race. Uh, I raced my first Kona early this year. Uh, we got to hang out with Bill quite a bit. Uh, and I'm now back in Sweden. I was uh, amazed, it's... by the way, Lisa. I was absolutely amazed at your performance, as I think everyone else in triathlon was. It was quite a quite a performance there. It was actually like tying back to what Oscar said uh, when we met there in 2012. I came fresh from the Olympics, and we had a, a camp in between the WTS race in Yokohama and the grand final in Auckland. And my coach at the time, he had a, another athlete racing in Kona, so he was like, well, you guys should come out to Kona, we have a camp there, and then you fly to Auckland, which is kind of makes sense time-wise. Uh, and I was in the harbor, just arrived. This was like 10 days out of the race, not much was built up. And I met this couple coming from one of the cruise ships. And they were asking about the swim course and how the race, like where it was gonna be. And I was like, actually, like I just arrived. I don't know, I'm racing the Olympic distance. They're like, oh, sorry, honey. <laughs> one day you get to race the real one. <laughs> and I was like, I just done the bloody Olympics, you know. <laughs> I think it's a big deal. And they were like, you know, one day you're going to get to do the Ironman and you'll be strong enough. So it was kind of cool to then 10 years later get back to Kona and, and you know, see it in the eyes and see what it was all about. Uh, now Sweden has the highlight of winter training. It's January, it's dark. 
uh, icy, slippery roads and just horrible in general. So it's peak season for swifting and indoor training. Uh, so I spend quite a bit of time in my garage at the moment. And so what, um, what, what do you use? Like in terms so of yeah. uh, we have a setup. So I have a techno gym treadmill uh, that I normally run uh, guided uh, sessions from training peaks. So my coach put in the run session in training peaks and then I get the um, actual speeds just coming on the treadmill. Something that I've been struggling to find a solution for, for everything seems to have to manually like fix the speed because I don't want to take the liability if something happens. So that's kind of a nice upgrade uh, this year. And then I have a Tax Neo bike and the um, Neo 2T. Uh, so on the 2T, I normally have my uh, time trial bike on. And then when I want to change position, I use the, the Tax bike. Yeah. And then Swift uh, monitors <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> iPad for the treadmill. And a fan to cool, maybe. Yeah. Um, actually, so this summer I did a bit of heat preparation for Hawaii. Uh, so then the fan was kind of banned from the garage. So now it's coming back into the garage again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about that uh, in in a little bit um, about how how you can use it to prepare for events like uh, like Hawaii. Um, are you someone who likes indoor training or hates indoor training? Or so being Swedish, you know, we were the originals uh, with indoor training back in the days. You know, you had dumb dumb trainers. That was like what we used. Um, yeah. You had your uh, cassette, your tape bands for your uh, stereo player and then you had different like mixtapes um, maybe like joined by a few friends maybe a few VHS cassette bands with some movies on that you can like watch when you were doing your cycling uh, so I must say there's been a huge development in terms of indoor uh, training and how it's done and today's indoor training is much more enjoyable and entertaining than back in the days but I think because of that time Obviously, back in the days, you don't want to spend too much time watching uh, old movies or mixtapes. Uh, so then you try to spend a lot of time outdoors as well. But there is the, um, the safety concern and also the quality. So if it's icy, it's bad conditions, it can be quite dangerous. You can get really cold. Uh, and if you want to do quality workouts, it might not be possible. Uh, because I find that when you ride outdoors, when it's cold, you need to stick to one one pace, how, how hard do you want to go today? And you dress accordingly and then you stick with it. So you can't have like a big view to max session followed by two hours easy because then you're really sweaty, you're warm and then you cool down and you get really cold and you go back home and you're absolutely done for Miserable. many days or you get sick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> so for the end of training, it's really been where I'm doing my quality sessions. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. Lisa. Um, so I've been using the indoor training for like all the quality sessions that I do winter time um, and also for quite a few base rides just to keep the conditioning ticking over. And so what would be for you, what would be a typical session if there is such a thing? So I have, I have a long, long ride um, between uh, 90 minutes and two and a half hours that are basically manually put into Swift slightly up and down, like maybe 20, 30 watts difference. So I have uh, three minutes on 275 uh, and I have two minutes on 200. Then I have four minutes on 280 and one minute on 200. And then it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Just to get a little bit of road feel for, like it's never static up there. It's never the same power. It always changing. And for the legs also to get a little bit of like, now it's a little bit harder, then you ease off a little bit and it feels better. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I throw in another half an hour of cadence work. Uh, so if I want to be three hours, I do the two and a half plus 30 minutes of cadence work going between 75, 70 RPM up to 100, 110, um, still base, base watts. Uh, and then I would do a very different session would be the VU2 max session with 30, 30, 30, 15 uh, in groups of 10 to 12 minutes, maybe three sets, sometimes with three one minuters afterwards that are quite challenging in the upper end of what I can sustain for one minute. 
So that would be a tough session that would last up to two hours with them 30 or 40 minutes easy at the end of it. Uh, and then another base session would be like eight minutes or 10 minutes going into TT position for maybe eight minutes into the base bar for two minutes, some easy pedaling back into the base bar for uh, a TT workout. And I would like just move between the base bar, the time trial bars uh, easy and up to, um, what do we say, um, stressed tempo or LT1 kind of um, pace for, for the work. Yeah. So your your sessions are actually quite long for because it, generally people will do shorter sessions I think on uh, on Zwift than they would outside because it's it is still a little bit harder mentally I think to uh, to ride in inside. Uh, so I think you... I have a I have a pretty good head for indoor training. Um, I think it's something you get used to as well. I find it's the same with riding on the road for. Uh, three hours when you get out on a training camp and you haven't done a lot of riding for a while that feels like a long time and then after a couple of rides it feels like it, you know three hours is nothing and it's the same for indoor training and you just have to move aside the time like I'm going to be here for two hours and it's fine I have um, a nice pod I maybe have some nice music and then I have a series that I want to watch so I listen to the music for the workout and then in the easy pedaling I turn on the series and then time kind of goes by um being in Sweden obviously I would love to do all my long rides outside but I can't so I have to find a way to do them indoors uh, but I'm aware of with the indoor training you're also quite locked into the position and we had quite a few hip injuries in the sport in the last couple of years that might be related to more indoor training when you're riding a mountain bike or a gravel bike you move around you work with you know, you have an uphill, you have a corner, you, you always like shift a little bit. And I think that's a lot nicer for the body. So I try mm -hmm. to change a little bit. And also on the indoor trainer, uh, I change the gradient quite a, a bit, quite often, just to get a slightly different gradient on the saddle uh, to save my butt a little bit as well. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I think it's definitely, uh, definitely true. So I'll... I'll talk a little bit about sort of the differences between riding indoor and outdoor in, in a little bit. But I think one of those differences is that indoor riding is pretty consistent. There are very few breaks. So if you if you analyze or if I analyze the, the power profiles of um, professional cyclists, for example, that ride on the road versus riding uh, indoors, then it's mostly different in that there are huge drops in power output outside that you don't see so much uh, indoors um, and so I think that is also something that may be related to uh, to injuries because you're constantly there's constantly pressure um, so what's the longest session you've ever done uh, I think actually I've been Sarah Nevada on the altitude camp I did a four-hour ride uh, because it snowed massively and when you drive to Sierra Nevada from the airport in Barcelona, you have a car with uh, summit tires on. So we were basically snowed into the center and you couldn't get down to sea level. You couldn't ride on the track. So there was only like the trainer option. And the tough part with the four hour was that it came after a three hour the day before. So we were in this room, we like three hour one day and the next morning you were back for another four hours. So we had the four, six, seven, a lot of hours um, in 24 hour of time span. Mm -hmm. um, also being in Sierra Nevada, you don't have a fancy Swift setup. And I think we were just watching like movies um, because you had to like roam on your iPhone if you wanted to use Swift on your yeah. phone. Uh, <laughs> so that was a bit more basic, uh, but I'm actually trying not to do too many super long ones. So I think back home three hour would be, you know, top of what I would do. And how do you, how do you approach that in terms of nutrition? So, <clears throat> like what I find really easy is that I can really control what I'm doing and I basically have a small buffet in front of me when I go on the trainer so I know I'm going to be there for three hours say if I do a three-hour session I know how hard that session is going to be because I have the program on Swift and I have the workout there so I know exactly the demands of the session in advance I know what the temperature is going to be like and I can estimate how much fluid I need uh, and I can easily calculate how many carbohydrates I would like to take on. 
And then I just line it all up in front of me or next to me where I have my little table and just like work through whatever I need. So I would have, I like the, I like to, I don't like to drink water too much. I'm a really bad water drinker. So I normally have some flavor to the drinks. Um, I normally mix a few different sports drinks if I'm going to be out there for a long time with different flavors. Um, so say the lemonade, pink lemonade, and then the, the lemon, just to make it interesting, maybe one each hour and then you change over. Uh, but basically I would do similar to an outdoor ride, um, unless it's a really tough load in terms of heat, uh, then I would need to drink much more. Uh, and if I get in trouble, I call my boyfriend who's in the house and he had to come and fetch me some water. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a water boy coming in and out too. Got him trained, Lisa. <laughs> exactly. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> a phone call away. Well done. So, um, and is there, is there a particular amount of carbohydrate that you're aiming for or how is that different for different sessions, for example? Yeah, it depends very much on the demands of the session and, and what I want to get out of it. Um, I had periods of time especially last year with uh, training my gut um, trying to increase the amount of carbohydrates that I could take on. And then some long demanding training sessions is a perfect time to utilize that as a, as a training session for it. Then I would go up to say I started at 60 gram. That was like the basic um, format we've been working on for many years, uh, moving up to 80 to 90 to 100. Um, I haven't done it indoors, but outdoors I've been up to 108 grams per hour for uh, six hours of work split over running and biking. Um, but indoors, normally, uh, unless there's been a massive load before, say a big run session in the morning, um, I would stick to maybe like 60 grams per hour uh, if it's a hard session. Uh, closer to races, and then I might top it up a little bit more. If it's a more basic session, then I would um, if, unless, as long as I eat and properly before and I know I have like storage and the session is two or three hours, then I would take on between 50 and 70. If it's less than two hours and it's not very hard, then sometimes it's just water. Um, and maybe like a few uh, lollies to count the 20 minutes in the hours or something. So I have something to tick off so I know I'm moving forward. Oh. And um... It's like you mentioned a couple of times the, uh, that it gets pretty hot when you do these uh, sessions. How much, how much do you sweat during the, uh, the sessions or how much water is there under your bike? <laughs> so <clears throat> with the current electricity prices, uh, we're trying to keep the garage at 14 degrees Celsius, uh, which is not very warm at all. It's oh. actually quite pleasant to, to ride in. And I think it was interesting watching like the whole Swift um, increase with COVID. So in Sweden, like you sit in a pretty cold garage and you have, you know, you have to have a fan when you work hard. And, and then you see the Spanish or the Italians sitting like in the hot living room with the iPad piled up on a, a stool in front of them and they're sweating like madmen. And so we always kind of have the opportunity with the cold weather and the cold like garages or basements where we have the bike set up uh, to keep the temperature down. So that was actually a struggle when I wanted to do heat training because we couldn't get the, the heat up in the garage that much, even in summer. So to do heat training, when I wanted to sweat a lot and I wanted to get the core temperature up, then I had to dress like crazy amount of clothes to get the temperature up. I would be in my winter Gore-Tex jacket with a rain jacket on top of it, with a hat um, and with like lost like warm tights on top of my um my bibs and sometimes also like shoe covers just to keep everything in and it would take me 40 50 minutes to get the core temperature up to where i wanted it and it would be like dropping out of the jacket there would be like a flood coming out with sweat um and i had I weighed like everything once with like the towels that I dried up underneath the, the bike and my clothes. And it was close to four or five kilos together. Oh, wow. And that was quite a big session. Yeah. But normally with a 14 degrees with a fan, it's actually not that bad. Yeah. You, your story um, about the electricity bill uh, reminded me of two students I had who um, 
that this was at the, at the University of Birmingham. They're both PhD students. They live together in a uh, in a house. And one day I noticed that one of the cycle ergometers was gone from the uh, from the lab. So I asked them, have you seen this ergometer? Where is it gone? And they'd actually moved it into their kitchen at home because they decided they were going to save some money and not turn on the heating and if they got cold they one of them would just get on the uh, on the bike and heat up the kitchen uh, <laughs> and they, they have did. any like scent candles or something for <laughs> <laughs> air hope fresheners did. i hope they did but yeah they they did that for a period of six months and then then i got my bike back so. um but it's yes it's interesting because you you've mentioned now um training the gut so you use indoor training for like, not just for training purposes, but actually to train the gut. You've also mentioned um, heat acclimation. So you're, you're doing the training, but you're also trying to, you have a different goal, and that is to um, acclimatize to the um, to hot conditions and prepare in your case for Hawaii, for example. So, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about uh, indoor training, that it's not just a training, it's, it's also a tool to prepare you for other um, uh, adaptations that you would get, such as like the gut. And actually, um, as you say, you can line up everything and it's much easier to do that indoors than uh, trying to organize this outdoor where you don't always have access to so much food and, and drink. Mm. And it's also the... I guess that's a good thing to train on as well. When you're out there, you have to physically like grab food and you have to find it in your pockets or under your jacket and you have to maybe refill your bottles. Uh, yep. Here, everything can be lined up in front of you and it's easy. And you can also see, like you can even set an alarm for every 15 minutes and you know exactly where you should be on your buffet <laughs> along the, the way. And the boyfriend on call. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm ahead of schedule. I need more. <laughs> exactly um so what in in the sort of heat acclimation uh sessions what what were you aiming for so i used one of the core uh, body sensors um where i wanted to so because we you know being in kona training you're under big load uh, and adding heat is another load and you can't just add things on top of each other because then something is going to give so you have to be careful with putting too much stuff into the bag. So I wanted to get a little bit of heat, like enough, enough to trigger the system, but not too much to make myself too tired or not recover. So I tried to stick, they recommended 38.3. I did one of these heat ramp tests in the beginning. Um, and then I tried to like stick as long as I could around 38.4. <laughs> and if I got to 38.6, that's when I started to take off clothes um, yeah. And then I could normally decrease my wattage. So normally that session would have the highest wattage in the beginning and then the wattage would come down and as would the clothes. And then sometimes I find like the line where I could keep riding the same pace, but just say um, where I was in terms of clothing. Um, so then also I tried to get somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour and a half uh, of exposure. So once I got up in temperature, then I would like start the watch and I would count the time I was in there. And if I'd done enough and I still had another 45 minutes to go, then I would put on the fan uh, or take off more clothes and yeah, stay comfortable for the rest of the ride. So I think it's, <clears throat> it's important to remember not to overdo things, um, to do enough, but not too much, especially when you're under such a big load as preparing for an Ironman. But I also had sessions where like a shorter session, say an hour and a half, where I would spend 45 minutes in the zone and then I would finish the ride, go straight to a hot bath and continue the load uh, in the bath afterwards. But then the temperature would normally go like really, really high <laughs> and it would yeah. take a long time to come down. Yeah. So you've also used the pills in, um, in those hot conditions. And uh, so. Sorry, sorry, what was that? You've also used the, the temperature. Uh, pills in like real life hot conditions not indoor uh, so not the pills but the sensor under yeah. sensor so. yeah. Yeah, yeah so i used it in uh, under training of course but then in said so, uh, the pto race in dallas that was very very hot and in kona cosmel uh, i trained with it in kona so from the beginning of 
of my arrival uh, until the race. I had quite a nice difference where my temperature was lower in the same condition on the same amount of work. So I could see that I was, um, my body was enjoying it much better and I was handling it better. So that was a nice way to see that I was being acclimatized and the body was working. But you can also feel that, like you probably don't need a sensor for it because you feel that you are doing better. Um, you're doing the sessions better, you're more comfortable. It's definitely like after a week or 10 days, you feel the difference in your body that you're like, actually, this is not that bad. I'm happy here. But I think that really, really helped me for the race. Um, the Dallas race was good because that was insanely hot. Uh, so it also gave me the respect um, that you can't go out no, too no, hard because there's going to be explosions. But then to have the actually the, um, the data that really helped me for the race. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, have you used Swift to work out how much you're sweating? So, uh, what I use for Swift is. Um, sorry, I think someone has the microphone on. <laughs> I just took care of it. It was. Uh, oh, cool. Good. Analysis did. It's fixed. Um, so, the only thing I've done that's fairly basic is using a scale. Uh, so, weighing myself before I started riding and weighing myself after. So, that's been like the dinosaur way of checking how much I'm sweating. Yeah. But it's been good because it's a good reminder of um, how much I need to drink if I drank enough or if I need to drink more. Uh, it's probably the only time I use a scale because I'm trying to avoid it otherwise and just focus <laughs> on the other bits. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably a topic that, would, uh, that we could spend the whole sort of webinar on, but it's, uh, I, I think, just measuring weight before and after is actually a super good tool to get a like a pretty good idea of your uh, sweat rates and it's uh, I, I think it's very simple but it's probably more reliable than a lot of the other methods that are sometimes uh, proposed so I, I would I would use that method to to get a really good idea of how much uh, I would sweat and uh, you can use indoor rides for that. Uh, I would always combine them with outdoor rides as well. But of course, indoors is super easy to do because you can just have the scale next to the next to the bike. It's uh, it's very easy to control. You can measure all the all the bottles that you would drink and correct for that. So it's uh, so. What amount of would you use an hour, or would you use more more time for doing your own sweat test? I don't think it matters that much. I think if you did an hour, just an hour, um, it, it would probably give you pretty good uh, results. We used uh, we did we did these tests with uh, sweat patches and then uh, compared sort of the first half hour with the second half hour and then after two hours and sweat rates are really very similar unless you become really dehydrated, then uh, your sweat rate is going to be affected. Um, so yeah, I would just do like relative. You can do relatively short sessions, and with um, if you actually do use sweat patches and measure uh, electrolytes as well, uh, for example, then you have to do short sessions because when the the patches saturate, that's when your results become unreliable. You can't use them anymore, so you you cannot sweat too much or for too long uh, with those patches. So. Um, but if you just measure measure weight, it, uh, yeah, it doesn't. It, I don't think it matters that much. Um, uh, let's see. What uh, are there any other topics that um, uh, have you raced on Swift? I um, have. Um, so I've done the Swift said try series. That was on for I think it's probably a couple of years ago now, um, which was insanely hard. I think the second time around there was three races. Uh, with a short break in between on three different courses, each around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and I also had the highest 90 minute power ever on the one of the Ironman races on Ruby. Wow. Um, so there's, there's been some really, really hard uh, workouts on Swift in terms of racing. But I haven't, I've never gone into a team or done any like proper professional racing that's now really developing on Swift. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess most of those races have been relatively short, no? Yeah, um, exactly. Like, well, the Swift, like we were on there for maybe an hour and a half because we had breaks in between. So they did the ladies and then the men, ladies, men. So overall, it actually took a long time. 
uh, but there was maybe three by 20 minutes hit outs in that hour and a half. And what did you do in terms of nutrition there? Because that's so being such a high intensity, I like maxed out on everything I could in terms of carbohydrates. And I had my boyfriend supporting me, uh, fetching water and making sure everything was like available. Um, he was there for the power ups and, you know, like you have to have a bit of assistance sometimes. Um, but then, you know, you drink as much as you can. So, like if you're racing, you probably can't, you know, you can't even grab your bottle. So you have to use the breaks in between and, uh, but really with carbohydrates to be on the upper side. So maybe like 90 per hour uh, and also use the, um, the breaks in between to really like top up on everything. So you start fresh. Yeah, really good. But they are like the most intense things ever. Like it's just hard <laughs> to replicate that. And I think you can go so much harder on Swift um, because in the real world, you have the, the reality of safety. Like you can actually crash your bike when you work too hard. In Swift, yep. like you can just go until you fall off your bike and it's fine. Yeah, and you can close your eyes. You don't have to worry about aerodynamics. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, I'm probably going to switch to the um, sort of the science part of the uh, of the talk. And then, uh, Lisa, if there's any at any point you have questions or you want to jump in, uh, just uh, just interrupt me as I'm doing the uh, the talk. But I'm going to share my screen and um, yeah, Bill, if you can give me. Okay, I've allowed you access. Yeah, you're all set. We have a lot of questions coming through, which is great as well. Yeah, so we'll make sure I'll, I'll try to cover this fairly quickly so we have plenty of time to uh, to get to people's questions. Because Sounds great. Um, just checking if this works. Or... Bill, can you let me know if this? Uh, right now, it's a black screen. Okay, then I'm gonna. That's good. Yeah, let me try and see if I can share it like this. Is that okay? That seems okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, then I'm gonna share it like this. So, um, fueling your indoor uh, training. So we talked about uh, Zwift, um, but of course it's it's one name for lots of different things that you can do on that uh, platform or in fact, very similar uh, platforms. So, but the first question when we get to like, what are the recommendations for these sessions? Um, the first question we need to ask is of course, how is indoor training different from outdoor training? And I think generally people spend less time on there. Their sessions are shorter, maybe a little bit more intense. The second point would be there is less wind cooling and that has effects on uh, core temperature, which then affects sweat rate. So we see generally very high uh, sweat rates. There's another factor there is that the sweat doesn't evaporate as easily from the uh, from the skin because we usually do this in rooms where the humidity is really high. So the cooling is actually much less, even though we may be very wet and it may look like we're sweating a lot, the cooling is not actually that effective. Um, I already mentioned that maybe we have fewer breaks and there is less uh, points in a session where your power output is zero uh, generally than it is on the road. An aero position is not important. Um, and then one interesting thing is that um, usually laboratory research gets criticized because this, people say, yeah, but that's laboratory uh, research. You can't like translate that to a real life situation. Cycling in a lab is very different from cycling outside. Well, in this case, it's actually very, very simple. So we can use the lab research to really predict what's going on uh, indoors. Now, the interesting thing is that actually the guidelines, even though we have all these differences between indoor and outdoor training, the guidelines are actually the same. And that is because the guidelines take into account things like how much you sweat, what is the uh, duration, of the uh, session and what is the what is the intensity? There are all things that go into a uh, plan. So if you use the same guidelines, you'll get a different advice indoor and outdoor, but the guidelines themselves are the same. Um, <clears throat> we 
talked about some of the different uh, platforms. Uh, Lisa mentioned uh, Ruby. Uh, we talked about Swift, but th this is just a selection of the platforms that we have now, and it seems to be like we see new platforms come up every uh, every year. Um, so Swift, Wahoo, Wahoo, I think has two platforms. Even one of them is called System. Uh, Tax, uh, Kinomap, uh, uh, Be Cool, Trainer Road is sort of the uh, the no nonsense version. It's just you go on there and you write. There's no fancy stuff. It is just here's your protocol, write it, um, and Full Gas is another one. So. These platforms differ in um, the way they look mostly. Some use real life uh, footage. Um, some is just uh, riding in a virtual world. And then if we take uh, Zwift as an example, because that's the world that I, uh, I, I know quite well, so it's easier to talk, talk about. Um, we have fondos, like we have fondos or grand fondos in real life. They're usually longer group sessions. They're almost like race like a race, but not quite a race. We have racing leagues. They are generally like proper races. Most of them like super high intensity and a slightly shorter duration. We have workouts where you can just follow a, a pre-planned workout or you can plan your own workout as Lisa did. Uh, we have time trials now where you can just uh, select your time trial bike and then uh, you ride a certain distance as fast as possible and it's just you and the road. Uh, maybe some other riders that uh, started before you or some of the ones that, uh, that will pass you as you're going along. We have several routes that uh, that you can ride and uh, one of the famous ones is the Uber Pretzel, which is... Uh, like that that would be a long ride on uh, on Zwift, uh, but beautiful ride. And then you have multi-stage, and at the moment, uh, I think it's stage one of uh, two of the Zwift. So these are all like different events. So you have one platform, but actually in terms of the demands, these are all quite uh, or can be quite different. Now, the most important part is probably the duration and the intensity. So if we go from left to right here on the left, uh, one of the things you can select is training and then just ride. I just go on there, I go on this route and I want to, I want, just want to ride. The middle part is where you join a group and you have to ride the pace of the group. Usually they're slightly harder and then yeah you can also participate in races and that is really eyeballs out. So those are the uh, the options. And obviously what you do in terms of nutrition uh, can be quite different. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these sort of really hard sessions where performance is really important is done, like is, is around sort of the 30 minute to 60 uh, minute mark. Um, what I'm going to talk now about is relevant to anything that is 45 minutes up to about 75 minutes, but on average an hour, but eyeballs out. In 1997, long time ago, we did a study uh, where we gave people carbohydrate or carbohydrate electrolyte drink, and we compared it to a placebo. The two drinks tasted identical. We had uh, about 20 riders who uh, did a 40 kilometer time trial in the lab, as you can see uh, here. And they did this all out. Like they had to ride as hard as they could with both the carbohydrate drink and with the placebo drink. And my expectation was before we started that there would be no difference in performance between carbohydrate and placebo. And the reason for that is that normally for a one hour ride, your body stores of carbohydrate are large enough then there's no reason why you should run out of carbohydrate so why would adding more carbohydrate help but we were somewhat surprised to find that performance was actually improved by one minute and that is of course a very significant uh, amount um it may not uh, sound like much but one minute in a 40 kilometer time trial is is huge so we just couldn't explain it. So we designed another study, looked exactly the same thing, 
the same way, 40 kilometer time trials in the lab. Uh, this time we changed one thing. Instead of asking him to drink the carbohydrate solution and swallow it, we asked, or uh, we, we gave that uh, same amount of carbohydrate through an intravenous infusion. So it was going into the vein, into the blood. They had no idea whether we were administering uh, a placebo, saline, or a carbohydrate, glucose. Um, in that uh, case, the, um, the results were that um, there was no effect whatsoever of all this carbohydrate that was infused directly into the blood. So we saw in the first study, we saw an effect of carbohydrate when it was ingested. But when we delivered the same amount of carbohydrate or even more through infusion, there was no effect. We designed a third study, and that third study was similar to the first one with one difference. We gave him the drinks and we asked him to swirl the, um, uh, the carbohydrate or the placebo solution around in their mouth. Uh, but instead of swallowing the drink, they were asked to spit it out. So no carbohydrate was swallowed, no carbohydrate was delivered as a fuel, uh, but there was contact between the carbohydrate and the uh, and your mouth or the oral cavity. Um, so from those three studies, these are the results. In study one, we saw a performance improvement. Study two, no effect. Study three, we saw the exact same performance improvement that we had observed in study one. Interesting because we hadn't delivered any carbohydrate. All the carbohydrate was spit out again afterwards. So, but this gave us an idea of what was happening. And this is the picture of the, uh, of the brain scan, because later we, uh, we started to scan the brain and that gave us uh, even more insights on what, what was happening. What we think happens is <clears throat> normally I have a, I have a colleague and friend who's called Romain Mercer. He's a professor or was a professor at the Free University of Brussels. And he always said, um, exercise starts and ends in the brain. And it's, it's true. Like you start exercise because there is a signal that goes from the motor cortex to the muscle and the muscle then contracts. The muscle then sends signals back to your brain saying, oh, I'm becoming really fatigued now. You should uh, stop. And then your brain makes a decision to either stop or not stop or go slower. It's, it's, um, it doesn't have to be a conscious decision. It can also be a subconscious decision. But that um, signal, the, the reduction of motor output, that then reduces the muscle contraction. That's fatigue. So this is what's happening. The brain sends a signal to the muscle. The muscle contracts. And as the muscle contracts, we get an increase in muscle temperature we get an increase maybe of hydrogen ions inside the muscle. We get an increase of metabolic byproducts such as AMP, IMP, uh, inorganic phosphate, all those things accumulate and they are sensed. They send the signal back to the brain and the brain says, whoa, there's a lot of like really negative feedback coming from the muscle. We need to slow down and then the motor output is reduced. Now, when you take a carbohydrate drink and you um, switch this around in your mouth, some of that carbohydrate will bind to receptors that we have in our oral cavity. When they bind to that receptor, it sends also a signal to the brain. And actually, it mixes with the signal that comes from the periphery, that comes back from the muscle. And it tells your brain, ah, there's carbohydrate on the way. Um, you don't have to feel so bad. You can actually keep pushing and it feels easier and you can maintain a similar uh, power output. So that was a theory that we worked with. We then started to look into this uh, through brain imaging studies. And we saw that if you rinsed with a carbohydrate solution, that certain areas of the brain started to light up. And these areas included the uh, orbitofrontal cortex, the striatum, and the frontal operculum. 
Now, those are also known as sort of the, the pleasure centers in the, uh, in the brain. The same areas that, for example, caffeine uh, or amphetamines work on. So that's something that, uh, that happens, a direct effect of carbohydrate that allows you to push a little bit harder. And that effect is completely different from the effect of carbohydrate as a fuel. So this is an overview of all the studies where they used a carbohydrate mouth rinse and looked at performance. If these bars are going to the right, so especially the ones at the bottom, they're going to the right, then that means there's a positive effect in that study on um, performance. If these bars go to the left, then there is, in this case, a few studies at the top, small negative effect, but really the, the top a uh, few studies show no effect. The majority of studies at the bottom, they do show uh, an effect. Overall, I think there are small effects of this carbohydrate mouth rinse. Some of the studies at the bottom, they show these very large uh, effects that has something to do with the type of measurement that was used to measure performance. Um, so probably don't want to go into that. But the uh, the blue, the light blue uh, bars are probably a little bit more reflective of what happens in the real world where we do time trials. So I think there is quite a bit of evidence that this carbohydrate mouth rinse indeed works, and we also have a mechanism. Um, for longer exercise, um, we really need to take into account two things, fluid intake, carbohydrate intake for different reasons. Carbohydrate intake for uh, fuel and fluid intake to make sure we don't become dehydrated. And these two are probably almost like you, you need to approach them almost separately. You need to calculate how much fluid do I need, how much carbohydrate do I need, and then you have to put them together. Um, so if we start on the left with the fluid intake, um, you can see that the, um, the sweat rate here in uh, liters per hour uh, can be calculated with this formula. Your sweat um, uh, loss or your uh, weight loss here could be uh, uh, one and a half or one or, uh, or very small, less than 0.5. You multiply that uh, by the hours that so zero to one or one to two hours. And then you want to make sure that by the end of your session, you don't lose more than 2% body weight. We know that in conditions where heat is really important, that you don't want to lose more than 2% because otherwise performance may be compromised. In some cases, it may be okay to lose 3% body weight. In some cases, especially longer exercise, and maybe even a little bit more. But for simplicity, let's, let's just do this. You want to make sure that whatever comes out of this, your sweat rate times this um, minus the amount that you drink is no more than 2% uh, body weight loss. That's how you calculate how much you need to drink. I'll have an example uh, in the next slide. And then in terms of carbohydrate intake, um, if it's between zero and 45 minutes, water is fine. If it's between 45 and 75 minutes, that's that mouth rinse effect. So really you need very small amounts of carbohydrate, but you probably keep have to keep it in your mouth a little bit longer. If it's one to two hours, then anything sort of between 15 and 30 grams of carbohydrate uh, will work. Two to three hours, you can probably push that up to 60. And if you go over three hours or maybe even two and a half hours and longer, um, you should be uh, going up to 90 grams uh, an hour. Um, especially with the higher intakes, it's extremely important that you have the right mix of carbohydrates, of glucose and fructose, and probably two to one ratio will work very well. So let's take an example here. Um, someone sweats 1.2 liters per hour. So for example, if you on uh, on your turbo trainer and you measure 1.2 kilogram uh, weight loss before and after your hour session, well, that would be 1.2 liters. In this case, the session is three hours. 
and you want to lose 1.5 kilos. Why? Because this is a 75 kilogram person, 2% body weight is 1.5 kilos. So what you need to do is you're going to lose three times uh, 1.2 liters is 3.6 liters minus the 1.5 that you're allowed to lose. That is 2.1 liters is what you have to drink or 700 mils per hour. So fairly simple uh, calculation. On the right, we have the carbohydrate intake. Well, this is a three hour session. So um, you could probably, um, I, I should have probably put this, uh, this here somewhere because in an ideal case, probably you push the carbohydrate intake up to 90 grams an hour. That's 270 grams in total. So that's how you would calculate it. And then you have to put these two together um, and see what works for you. And some can do this with gels and water, or some would do this with just sports drinks, or some would do this with a, a C90 and something, something else. It doesn't really matter how you mix it as long as you get to um, these amounts per hour, 90 grams an hour, 700 mils per hour. I know this is a busy slide, but I want to make one slide that had like all of this information in one place. I think the most important decision um, is like, what is my goal? What am I trying to achieve? And uh, the first role is really everything where performance is essential or you are really training the gut or you're practicing race nutrition. But there is a real focus there on performance. So every second matters essentially in that, uh, in that category. So if that's, um, if that's the question you ask yourself uh, and every second does matter, then that's everything that, uh, that you would have to do. If the session is less than 75 minutes, the advice is a bit different than 75 minutes to two hours or two to three hours or greater than two and a half. And we can make this available to you so that we don't have to go through every little detail of, uh, of this. The, the second goal here would be a little bit different. It's still, performance is still important, but now your goal is, well, I wanna stay strong till the end. Uh, but in the end of the day, like a second faster or slower, it doesn't really matter. Um, and that changes the recommendations quite a bit because it means that you don't really have to push all that time, all, all, all the time. Um, it doesn't mean that what you eat before has to be like spot on and perfect. Um, so if we take, for example, the difference here between like if we take a two, in, two to three hour session here, um, if performance is really important, then you need to eat well two to three hours before with a focus on carbohydrate. You need to ingest uh, 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Um, and after two and a half hours, if, if you're really doing a session that's longer than two and a half hours, then consider like pushing that even uh, higher um, and make sure that you have uh, multiple transportable carbohydrates. Drink enough so that you avoid that 2% uh, body weight loss and also like caffeine could be uh, something that could help in a session like that. But this is really when the seconds count. If it's slightly less important, then I would just eat two to three hours before. There's still a focus on carbohydrate, but it's, it's a little bit less important. I would take 60 grams an hour and I would drink when I'm thirsty. Um, so the rules there are a little bit more relaxed. Um, and of course, if we go to a leisurely ride or a social ride, or uh, Lisa puts the TV on and watch her ser watches her series, um, then yeah, you don't have to go 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour, 30 grams of carbohydrate is fine. You can drink when you're thirsty. Hey, That's... I can still ride pretty hard when I watch series. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I misunderstood. <laughs> um so I think, yeah, this is a like a bigger overview of um, like without going through every every little part of it, you, you, you get the point of this. So it's first decision, how important is every second? Um, and then what is the duration? They're the two most important decision criteria. And then the 
the more important performance is, the more serious you need to take that nutrition and the higher you push your carbohydrate and the more you try and prevent um, uh, dehydration. So I've summarized in this uh, slide sort of all of the things that I would think about when I want to optimize uh, a session on uh, Zwift. So in terms of hydration, well, let's try and keep the body weight loss to below 2%. Um, make sure that we have the right amount of carbohydrate for the duration of the session. And it could be either 30, 60 or uh, 90. Make sure that you have drinks, gels, bars, slush, whatever you need to meet those goals. Um, now that's very personal because some people like gel, some people don't. Some people like to have water, some people Lisa, don't. So that's really personal, but it doesn't matter because you can achieve those goals in, in many different ways. Then on the right, I have some uh, factors that have to do with uh, your body heating up. Uh, and preventing them because your body core temperature going up is also um, a cause of fatigue. Fan cooling is very important. Um, or having a garage at 14 degrees, that, that also helps. Uh, ice, uh, ice and cold towels, this is something that we would use. Um, like all, all of these things are things that we try to use at the uh, Tokyo Olympics, uh, for example, where you have these really hot conditions. So uh, ice and cold tower, towels were seen everywhere. Uh, cold drinks were seen everywhere. Slush, uh, gosh, we, uh, we, we took slush machines everywhere to all, uh, to all venues. And uh, it was a logistical nightmare to get to to get this done but we uh, we managed to get slush to uh, to athletes at all places um and then some people have suggested that uh, menthol is uh, is another way to cool down the uh, the body but it's more uh, of a perceived uh, cooling so you you don't actually get a drop in uh, core temperature but maybe the perceived cooling effect of menthol also has an effect now, studies have looked at this and have found that this can indeed have a significant effect, a measurable effect on performance. The only sort of hesitation that I have is that the doses of menthol that need to be used to get this effect are so high that, in, in my experience, athletes don't keep using it. So if you want to have a product or something that has the amount of menthol in that has this, uh, uh, or that still that is palatable. You have to reduce the man, the amount of mantle so much that it is not going to be effective anymore. So um, that one has for me a bit of a sort of a practical question mark. Even though in like a laboratory you can show that it it can work. Um. So we talked about the different sort of goals that people have in terms of performance from like the super hard uh, races to uh, just finishing a hard uh, ride where not every second is that important to the just the rides on uh, on Zwift. Um, but we also, Lisa talked about like how you can measure your sweat rate and use um, your indoor training to as a really convenient way to measure how much you're actually sweating and get much better insight in how much uh, sweat you're losing or you can use it for heat acclimation um, or you can train your gut or train your nutrition you could have um, a plan for uh, race nutrition and line it all up and try and see if you can execute that indoors um, and then one point that we haven't talked about is uh, training your fat burning of course you can do that as well and the way i would do that is probably uh, getting up, no breakfast, get on the uh, trainer and uh, and ride. Uh, any breakfast will suppress your fat burning. It will increase your carbohydrate uh, use. So by um, doing this before breakfast, uh, you have basically a 10-hour period or an 8 to 10-hour period where you haven't eaten. Um, so your insulin is an absolute low that allows you to burn uh, fat. Um, the problem then is maybe 
like uh, 45 minutes or 60 minutes into that ride, you start to feel a little bit uh, weak or hypoglycemic. Um, but at that point, your adrenaline or your epinephrine is uh, is up. And you can start to have a little bit of carbohydrate because that adrenaline or epinephrine will uh, suppress your insulin. So if you have small amounts of carbohydrate, like 45 or 60 minutes into that ride, you will still maximize your uh, fat burning. Um, I should say that there are there are studies, plenty of studies actually, that show that this can work. Whether that has an, a, an actual performance benefit, that's much more difficult to show. Um, so turn indoor training into a lab testing. So um, these are the same uh, points measuring sweat rate. So uh, I would measure nude body weight before and after, corrected for fluid intake. Heat acclimation, if possible, record your heart rate, uh, record uh, temperature with temperature pills or, or the sensor, um, because that will show you that over just a period of like even five days, you see massive changes um, and adaptation occurring, and you can get a complete adaptation in just 10 days uh, if you do it uh, right. You can practice your race nutrition plan, uh, you can train the gut, and you can train your fat burning. So those are all the things that you can use indoor training for. Excellent. And then um, just finishing off with uh, this, this guy who did a thousand kilometer ride on uh, Zwift during uh, COVID, uh, yeah. more or less for the fun of it. And I know that he is now planning a 2,000 kilometer ride. So good luck for him. Uh, I do recommend that he keeps drinking his coffee. So. <laughs> um, and then the final uh, a bit of advice for everyone that relates to the mouth rinse uh, studies. Um, we, I think that mouth rinsing does work, but um, if I were you, I would not spit it out on the on the floor. It's okay to actually swallow the uh, that drink. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. That was great. Then, Lisa, thanks so much for your input. Um, we have a quite a number of questions that came in. I'm just uh, going to stop the screen share. Okay. We have about uh, 20 minutes, um, so I'll, we'll go through and see how many um, how many of the questions we can get answered. <laughs> uh, first question comes in, uh, let's see. We talked about sweat rate. Uh, here is, uh, Dan, this question comes in from Daniel uh, Hofstetter. He asks, Oscar, you put the relevance of sodium concentration in drinks into perspective relating to duration, fluid replacement, sweat rate. Can you please elaborate a bit more on that? Would you say it is overrated and so are all the salt tablets that are so widely used and talked about? Um, yeah, so the short answer is yes, I think it's overrated. Um, it's uh, definitely, uh, I think, overused or uh, abused. Um, but it's it comes from the idea that you sweat you lose water you lose sodium as well um, you lose other electrolytes as well but actually if you measure the other electrolytes you you really lose very small amounts so that's why everyone focuses on sodium because that's the one that you lose more of but the assumption then is that well you lose sodium and therefore your body is going to get depleted of sodium but the fact is that we have about 70 grams of uh, sodium. Um, so you need to sweat a lot over a very long period of time before your body sodium source would be depleted uh, or even affected in, uh, in, in some way. Oscar, the putting other... that in perspective, what do you, when, when you say a lot and over a long period of time, we get a lot of, uh, of inquiries from athletes that that will... Uh, you know, say they're going to doing a three hour ride and they're concerned about their uh, their sodium intake levels. Do you have any sort of advice that's specific to that 
relationship? I know it's it's quite it varies quite a bit individual to individual, but is there a general guideline for most athletes? No, I don't think there is because it varies so much. Um, I mean, if if you if we're really talking numbers, the some people sweat two hundred milligrams per hour. That's very very little, right? That's uh, that that's what you can find in just uh, in in one gel. Uh, some people sweat up to three grams per hour. That's really extreme, but it happens. Um, but it usually happens at an intensity that you couldn't sustain for very long. Um, so it's it's not that you're going to lose three grams per hour for a period of ten hours, and therefore you lose thirty grams. That's that's probably not going to happen. There, there may be odd cases where people get close to that. Um, but the then the much bigger problem is that <clears throat> sweat is very dilute. So it's more dilute than your blood, which means when you're sweating, you always lose more water than you lose sodium. So that risk of becoming dehydrated is far, far greater than the risk of becoming sodium depleted or hyponatremic. Um, so where, where the risks um, happen is those people that drink very large amounts. That's where uh, it is actually possible to, uh, to, to get an issue. And we, we know this also from the literature that, uh, and, and from real live examples of where people drank like crazy amounts of especially uh, water um, and that caused hyponatremia. So it's more the drinking that then dilutes your uh, sodium than the depletion of sodium because you lose sodium and sweat. Sorry, that's a long answer, but no, that's great. That's really helpful. A lot of athletes also ask, you know, what percentage of athletes fall within a normal range? I know there's this wide range that you mentioned. Is there, you know, there are the athletes that have a legitimate, legitimate high sodium sweaters and one, then ones that fall into, let's say, the low to medium range. What are the, is there a, a rough percentage statistically that speaks to what percentage of athletes actually are heavy sodium sweaters? I would I would say about ten, like really high, like about ten percent, one at one in ten. That is like fairly like high. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks very much, Oscar. Um, Lisa, we have the next question that we have is is for you. Um, Caroline Cavanaugh asks if you use a different sport drink in training than you use in racing. Good question, Lisa. What makes you choose between, like, for instance, C thirty and C ninety? And, and how do you how do you view that? Uh, sometimes it's availability, <laughs> whatever is in the cupboard, right? Okay. Um, and, and for racing, it's mainly um, to make it easy for myself to get everything on board for the full Ironman. So how to do the calculation with um, with the carbohydrates and the amount that I want. Um, I use only never second products, so basically I use all the products all the time. And I don't want to change it too much. So whatever I do in training and preparation, I want to do the same thing in the race. So when I get to the race, I know I have trialed and tested and very confident that this will work with my gut, with my system under pressure in the heat, da, 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 da. Um, I do really like the C90. I think it's like fresh and it's like, it's so easy. Like if I know I have a hard session that takes three hours, I take three bags and I mix it up and I take it with me. If it's hotter, I have bigger bottles. Um, or the little, if it's not that hot, I might put two in one bottle and use that for the two hours. So a lot of C90 is going uh, down back at my house. I was going to say, do you primarily focus more on C90 when you're sweating less in the colder weather and then move towards the different, the C30 as the weather gets warmer? Or does that... Yeah, so if, of course, if I need to drink more, uh, then I can be more generous with the fluid. Um, mm -hmm. Now riding outdoors in winter, I tend to use a camelback because it keeps uh, a better temperature on the fluid. Yeah. Uh, and I know I won't drink, you know, three bottles for a three hour ride. It's almost impossible. But if I have two liters in the camelback, I still need the carbohydrates. So then I would have a much more dense uh, fluid with me. Understood. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, 
another question comes in from Christian Schneider um, talking about gut training. What session is ideal? I'm speaking specifically about indoor training sessions. What is uh, what session is ideal for gut training, Oscar, in your mind? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I think ideally you want an intensity that's a little bit comparable to what you're going to do in a, in a race, because if it's too easy, then you could probably eat a three course meal and not have any problems with it. Um, so it needs to be a little bit in the direction, at least of what you would be, uh, the race you would be using it. Uh, um, it also needs to be long enough so that you can get enough carbohydrate uh, in. So it's, um, yeah, it's usually a little bit of a balance of intensity and duration, trying to mimic the, the race as close to po as possible. Um, of course, you can never really, like in an indoor session, it's really hard to, uh, to mimic uh, like the intensity and the duration of the, of the race exactly. So what, what I would do is because that intensity and duration may be a little bit short or lower, uh, I would increase the carbohydrate intake a little bit above what I would uh, be planning to take. Do you, um, and I guess this question is for both you and, and Lisa, um, when you're looking at your, um, I mean, as you start getting ready for like, let's say racing season, how do you treat carbohydrate intake with training relative to how do you treat it in racing? Are you generally going for you know, when you're doing your key gut training sessions, are you shooting for a number that's the same as a race event or slightly higher than a race event? And how many times a week should uh, athletes be um, working on gut training? What's the recommendation on a weekly basis or monthly basis? I think, yeah, Lisa can talk about what she, uh, what she does, but uh, I think my, my recommendation would be to do this at least once a week. Um, okay. And probably it, it also needs to fit in with the with, with the, the training sessions and uh, and what else you're going to do because it it would interfere, for example, with the fat burning training. And so it needs to fit into the week. The sessions need to be long and hard enough to uh, to to do it. So I think with one, once a week and then doing that several uh, several weeks that uh, that will give you some adaptations for sure. So we typically had like solid training camps um, in the preparation of going into a big race. Um, I had my first phase in St. Moritz this year in March, uh, where I did a lot of uh, overloading in terms of carbohydrates. And basically I went to above what I wanted to use for the race or what Asuka recommended me to use in the race, just to see how I would feel, <laughs> would I feel better or would I feel worse? Or where's my limit, where's my breaking point where I can't take on anything more? Uh, and I must say there's like a very positive side effect that the training, so we were on altitude and we trained really hard and training was so good because I think I topped up my levels of carbs quite often and really had such a good effect from the training camp. So it's, I find it really useful, not only for training my gut, but also for increasing the performance in, in training compared to being a little bit lazy, being a little bit like on the lower side of what I should take on board, which is quite easy when you train a lot and you're out there for, for a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lisa, for that explanation. Um, Oscar, another question comes in from Christian Schneider. Um, who definitely follows your work. I uh, he said he's read an, uh, an article from Oscar about slow carb products that suggest that they're mostly useless. Um, I read other, other articles that say they might help uh, with fat oxidation. Uh, can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that useless was the, the technical term used. <laughs> but, uh, That's the takeaway, um, Oscar. But yeah, no, the, I think as a takeaway is probably correct. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think like slow carbohydrates, yes, they, if you compare them to fast carbohydrates, they will have greater fat burning. They will. Um, but at the same time, they are delivering a small amount of carbohydrates. So if you've done a smaller amount of the, uh, of the fast carbohydrate, you would have gotten the same effect because that's essentially what is delivered. So if we, if we look at this... A slow carbohydrate basically sits in the gut 
for a long time and then it's taken up a little bit is taken up say 10 grams is taken up you've ingested 100 grams that's all sitting in the gut you take up 10 grams so that 10 grams is not going to have much effect on suppressing fat metabolism if you take 100 grams of fast carbohydrate it immediately is absorbed insulin goes up fat oxidation is suppressed but you've then delivered 100 grams of carbohydrate not 10 if i just ingested 10 and that was immediately taken up i would have gotten exact same effect on uh, fat metabolism so i don't know why anyone would want that 90 grams of carbohydrate just sitting in the gut i don't know uh, unless you would do a very long raise and you would never have access to any sort of carbohydrate and the only way to store it was in your gut you wouldn't be able to carry bottles or something but it's such an unrealistic situation that um yeah so i i don't think um i can't remember what the technical term was but i don't think it's gonna work okay fair enough can i ask a question on the same topic um so say for a, a daily example if i would do I'm in a big training block and on this particular day I have a 5k swim in the morning which is low intensity easy basic work in the afternoon I then have a really big bike session with maybe a hard run off the bike would that be a time where you still want carbs to allow the afternoon training be good but you don't want to you have no need for a lot of carbs or fast carbs because it's a low intensity workout or would it then be better to take on 10 grams of normal carbs during the swim session or would it be good then to have a slow carb that would stick with you for a long time to be there for the afternoon sessions yeah so if, if the sessions are really easy you can you can almost like eat normal right so uh, so that's in this situation that's what i would recommend Let, let's just eat normal before the the first session and if you eat normal most of yeah a lot of it will be it will be slower um, because you're going to combine your carbohydrate with some fat and some protein, some fiber, and that's all going to slow it down anyway. Um, so this this whole discussion about fast versus slow carbohydrates, it, it's only relevant really if we just, like all we're ingesting is a, is a powder of carbohydrate, and that's the only thing. So in, that, in this case, I would solve it with normal food, and that will, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be fast for that swim. Um, but you still need carbohydrate for the later session. So yeah, solve it, solve it with food would be my suggestion. Awesome. In the pool or just before? I, I would, um, well, so th this then depends on you, I think, on, uh, on, on the individual, because some people don't want to eat before they get in the, in the pool. Well, then you need to find a solution mm. for that. I, I would probably have that before uh, going into the pool because uh, there's a challenge of decking up the the buffet on the on the pool deck <laughs> lane two <laughs> yes <laughs> the sandwich and the yogurt and yeah yeah no i mean it's i, I wouldn't probably wouldn't do it during i would probably do it before um uh, but that's yeah so so it, it's finding like a solution that really works for that very particular situation Thanks. I think we have a time for about three more questions. So we have probably 20 or so that I don't think we're going to have time to get to today. So we'll, we'll go ahead and answer those um, after the session uh, uh, individually to each of the, um, the, 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 uh, the folks that are asking. Uh, next question comes up from uh, Luca who asks, are you looking to make a zero or low calorie hydration drink in the future uh, with only electrolytes? Oscar, what's your thinking on that? So, yeah, I mean, listening to Lisa, I think there is definitely, there could be a reason for that because sometimes like this, really that, that sort of product would not be very different from what water does. It's delivering fluid mostly. And then, yeah, the electrolytes, as, as I said earlier, is probably not really that important, but delivering the fluid is. And sometimes you want the fluid without all the carbohydrates so i think there there is a there is a role for this product and it would help lisa because she prefers flavored drinks to uh, to water so um 
<clears throat> but yeah, as, as an electrolyte drink, but I don't think it's about the electrolytes. It's just about delivering the fluid in a nice and palatable way. So, yeah. The next question comes in from Pierre, uh, who asks, uh, how does the strategy differ between cycling? A lot of the conversation is in this uh, presentation has been around cycling. How would you, how would you, think about the differences when you're looking at running on the treadmill. Yeah. So I think the, the differences are not so much in the in the physiology because the, I don't think there really is a difference between cycling and running. We've done the studies to compare it at exactly the, the same intensities and in terms of absorption and how much carbohydrate you use, it really is the same. And I think the, the advice should be exactly the same. The, the issue is sometimes that runners say, uh, well, I can't really like take that much on the uh, on the run. And that just has to do with the sort of the practical side of things. So the, the bouncing effect, the, the, the fact that it's more difficult to grab uh, drinks and it's more difficult to, to eat. So those are more the, the practical side of things, but the, the effects are still the, the same. So the advice for me would also be uh, the same. Um, runners don't do a lot of gut training or at, le at least they didn't now I see more and more runners who uh, who do this and uh, I remember doing this training uh, a very long time ago with Haile Gebre Selassie and um, that was like really new at the time and he did um, he would run in the morning and then he would at lunchtime, he had a two hour treadmill run and that's what he used to do his uh, gut, gut training. And um, he would easily do 90 grams uh, an hour in the, on, on the treadmill at his uh, leisurely place, uh, pace of uh, 17 and a half kilometers an hour. So. <laughs> um. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, we have one, one more question, um, I guess, to both of you from uh, Roberto who asks, um, never heard about te temperature pills. Could you please describe that uh, in a little bit more detail? Yeah, so te temperature pills have been around for a long time. So it's essentially um, like a, a, a electronics in a pill form that you uh, ingest. You wait till it's in the right position in the uh, in the intestine. And then once it's in the right position, um, it measures, you know, it provides a measure of your core temperature and it sends a Bluetooth signal to a device or to your phone. Um, so you get like immediate data on your uh, core temperature. And so it's, if it's placed correctly, it gives very good data on, uh, on core temperature. Um, we don't usually reuse the pills. Um, that's a, so it's a basically a yeah, disposable uh, disposable pill, of course. Um, but yeah, it's a good way to uh, to measure it. But the the equipment still is is fairly expensive. So I think the uh, probably the sensors that Lisa used are a little bit more sort of practical, affordable as well. Can I ask you, do you know the, the difference in accuracy? Have you seen any studies on that? Because the sensor uses an algorithm because it only has the skin temperature, right, to, to base the data from. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the pill is sort of a research instrument. That's also why it's so uh, why it's so expensive. So the recorder is expensive and each pill is about 25 euros, 30 euros. Um, so yeah, every measurement is quite expensive. So it becomes more of a research than a, than a practical tool. Um, that is really very accurate if it's done in the right way. So if, if you don't wait long enough, for example, and you drink a cold drink, well, you will immediately see that in your, uh, in, in your measurements and it's, it's pointless. So you have to wait till it's in, in position. The, the comparisons with the sensor, I haven't actually seen. So I, I can't really, um, it's, it's also a question of, from a practical point of view, how accurate does it need to be? Mm. Like the temperature pill is really about, I guess, two decimal places. It's, it's very accurate. Uh, do we really, in a practical situation, do you really need that accuracy? So it's, I, I think it just needs to meet sort of the minimal needs for accuracy, uh, and then it can be useful. So yeah. 
but uh, yeah, I don't know studies that have done that comparison. And one more question when we have you here, uh, talking about indoor training, but um, the stuff that's happened in the water, what difference is that on body cooling in swimming compared to them being in the air and being on the bike or running? Because you have a different element touching the skin the whole time. Yeah, I mean, in, in, uh, in, in the water, it's very difficult to control um, uh, body temperature. Um, and that's, uh, like, I don't have a lot of experience, but uh, some experience with open water uh, swimmers. Uh, we, I, like, if they swim in, like, hot hot water, then, yeah, it's, it's like, almost impossible to, uh, to control uh, body temperature and the only way to control it then is to reduce the exercise intensity and reduce the heat the heat production which is of course not something you want but something you have to um and then in uh, in in tokyo for example uh, cooling with ice and slush uh, was one of the mechanisms to try and bring down the uh, the the core temperature but it's uh, yeah but so say different. for uh, for normal normal people training in maybe hot pools, you have a pool that's fairly warm where you're living, uh, then and you see a lot of people not bringing drink bottles, for example, to the pool. Would that be something that you know we need to be careful with? If you swim in hot pool, you need to drink maybe more than what you think you should. Or yeah, I think I mean to be honest, I think the drinking is only going to have so it's it's core temperature is one issue. And then it's the dehydration is the other issue. Uh, and I think the, the core temperature is much more concerning, I think, in that situation than, than dehydration. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and how you manage that is like, well, a cold drink um, can have a very small reducing effect. But, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's just a... It's not going to be a problem for swimmers that just don't reach the intensities that really produce a large uh, body body heat but in the swimmers that uh, do reach that intensity it, it could be a real problem yeah. okay thanks and then probably the best way to deal with it is to just get out of the pool and uh, in in between and uh, just let core temperature come down and then do the next part of the training Thanks, Oscar. Thanks for the explanation. Um, and I, I wanted to uh, conclude by saying, first of all, thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for uh, for helping out today and and uh, sharing some of your uh, stories as well as your uh, your strategies uh, and some of your thoughts with Oscar. Oscar, thanks as much. Uh, thanks rather as well for uh, for doing the webinar today with us. As, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the session, uh, you can rewatch uh, this webinar uh, and as well as other webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be hosting a new webinar uh, every month uh, through the end of 2023. On February 9th, our webinar uh, will be all about getting your nutrition right for your spring marathon. And if you're on our mailing list, um, uh, you'll receive an invitation for this and other upcoming webinars. Uh, we hope you'll join us, obviously, and uh, if you're not currently signed up, uh, you can uh, join our newsletter uh, by visiting uh, never2.com, that's N-E-V-E-R 2.com. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and we hope you found our webinar, uh, webinar helpful and uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Have a great Thanks. day. Bye, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you, Billy.